Okay, so welcome everybody. We are so grateful to have you here. Um, if you, I'm gonna put in the comment or the chat box, a link for um, questions. So as Brother Woodward goes through the, his presentation, we're gonna have a Q&A afterwards for about 15, 20, 25 minutes, depending on how many questions you guys ask, right? Um, but we're gonna have that Q&A. And so if you'll just click on the link, it'll allow Brother Woodward to see your questions. Um, in real time so that he can answer them um, in real time if he feels the need or uh, as we do our Q&A. Uh, but if we could start with a word of prayer, then I think that would, would start us on a good note here. And if it's okay, uh, can I call on Brother Farley? Would that be all right? Would you be willing to say it for us? Absolutely, I'd be happy to. Let me, let me pause the recording real fast. Okay, so um, if you weren't here last week, we had a great uh, first half of this discussion from the restoration of the church up until um, 1852. And so I will turn the time over to Brother Woodward. Um, if there's anything that you'd like to say beforehand before you jump into it, feel free. Um, but the time is yours, and then we'll have the Q&A after. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for having me. Happy to be here. Uh, San Diego Institute people, hello. Good to, good to see you. Um, man, yeah, let me share my screen here and we'll, uh, we'll jump in to the party and, uh, let's see, that's the one, okay, boom, okay, here we go. All right, can y'all see that? So yeah, last time we, uh, we, we talked about the, the three phases of the, the priesthood temple ban. Uh, the uh, phase one was that there was no temple ban, 22 years of no temple ban. Uh, phase two, 126 years of a priesthood uh, temple ban. We're going to talk about how that started today and how it ended, how we got to phase three, where uh, we basically revert back to phase one, where temple and priesthood are available to all. Uh, just maybe one, one thought from last time to summarize is that for, so for 22 years, uh, Joseph Smith's entire prophetic career, priesthood and temple privileges are open to all. Uh, Joseph's uh, policy was always one of inclusion and full participation. That's very clear from the historical record. And uh, that Brigham Young continued Joseph's policy of inclusion for a few years after his death, after Joseph's death. We, uh, we looked at an example last time. Uh, about Brigham Young calling uh, Q. Walker Lewis, a, a black African priesthood uh, holder in Massachusetts. He said he's one of the best elders we have in the church, one of the best elders. And uh, he said, we don't care about the color. Uh, God has made uh, of, of, of one flesh, the whole human family and, uh, or of one blood, he said, uh, quoting Acts 17. And so uh, things were humming along nicely that way. Uh, and then that all changed. And then that all changed. It changed in, uh, in 1852. So let's build up to that uh, for a moment. Let's talk about uh, coming across the plains. The winter quarters is where we stopped last time. And now we're across the plains. We're in Utah. Utah is a territory, not a state yet. And the Brother same Woodward, can I interrupt you for just one second? Yeah, you um, I, I loved how you set it up last time with those caveats. Um, could you happen to just... Um, share those caveats just really quickly to, to give us oh, a good review, review basis. Yeah. Of course, of course. For those that are new today. I will. Uh, let me see. I need to pop out of here for a second. Uh, let me go. So I, I had a few, didn't I? Uh, caveat number one was, uh, was this, that uh, this topic is complex and challenging. Uh, introduces a strong dose of complexity into what might be the pleasant simplicity of cozy testimony. So we got to be careful as we talk about this, that everything stays in context and that we're prepared, uh, that we're mature, that we're compassionate as we go throughout this so that we, uh, that the complexity can actually serve to, to strengthen testimony, help them mature and become less susceptible to, uh, to attack. Uh, but it's uh, definitely going to cause us to confront uh, our comfortable assumptions about prophets and God. So if you weren't here last week, we started into that a little bit, but uh, we're really going to go there today, if that's all right. Uh, another caveat, let's see, was uh, this one, that the, the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. We want to be good tourists. 
as we go into the past and not bring our uh, 2021 perspective uh, and judge them by it. Now, that's not to say that everyone gets a free pass in the past, right? Um, but we do want to judge them by 19th century standards as best as we understand that. And uh, I don't have time to go into what 19th century standards of racism were uh, and, and race views, but I did that all last video. So go check that out if that's something you haven't looked at yet. But it's, they, it's definitely different. <laughs> you got to be careful. Some people want to play gotcha with the past and pull out some awkward quote from Brigham Young, which I'll share a few of them today. Uh, totally out of context and just say, look, look how racist your church is, you know, and, uh, and you know, gotcha, gotcha with this, this quote. Uh, so we just want to be careful. And we want to understand the people in their own time and context and just be as charitable as we can. And then let's see, was there another cat? Maybe there's another one or two here. Um, Brother John, you just tell me if, if I'm on track here. Uh, the other one was, uh, uh, yeah, that uh, modern church leaders condemn any and all racism in our past. Uh, it's there. It exists. We're not fans of it, right? And we're trying, we're, we're learning, we're growing, and we're building. And uh, but sometimes we're pleased with what we see in the past. Uh, Joseph Smith was uh, very good, uh, not by 2021 standards, but, uh, but very good according to standards of his day. And, uh, and others were a little more disappointing. And uh, we're, we're going to talk about some of that today. And caveat number four, if I remember right, was, let me find it here. Uh, well, uh, we're going to get to, to number four uh, in a little bit. So we're going to revisit number four. So that's no problem. Is that all right, Brother John? We, we get there? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah good. So, um, so here's the situation. So we got a bunch of converts from the South that are coming to Utah territory, which is predominantly white. And uh, they, they're bringing with them their slaves. And there's about 100 slaves total. And there's uh, uh, the, the, the U.S.-Mexican War had just ended. Uh, we won. And uh, that meant that uh, we got to decide what to do with Utah. Should Utah territory become a slave territory or should it become a uh, free territory? And the reason this was a, a relevant conversation was because we have these, these slaveholders in Utah who've joined the church, brought their slaves with them. Some of their church or some of their slaves are members of the church. So you have some church members presiding or, uh, or uh, uh, owning other church members as, as property and slaves. And so it's a little bit of a, uh, of a situation, a little bit of a situation there. And so uh, what, they, what they do is uh, they decide to sanction slavery in 1852. Uh, they go with this in order to accommodate the, uh, the, the slaveholders. Well, this is actually the context. It's actually in two speeches that were delivered before the Utah Territorial Legislature in January and February of 1852, uh, where Brigham Young uh, was advocating for Utah Territory to become a slave territory. He simultaneously announced the policy restricting uh, Black men of African descent from priesthood ordination. So that's, uh, that's important context for what's about to, what I'm about to share with you. And, and a lot of this, we, we didn't have this really firmed up until the, the, the race and priesthood essay was, uh, that came out in the gospel topics. Uh, hopefully you're familiar with that. And, uh, and even more has come out since then. That was in 2013. Uh, and we know even more crystal clear uh, about the origins of this practice, uh, which hasn't always been clear in our history. And that's important to know. It's not like everybody knew and we just kind of swept it under the rug. It's not like that at all. There was a a long period where we did not know where this practice, this ban originated, uh, but now we do. And so I wanna walk you through what we know. Uh, we'll draw some conclusions from, from the, the available evidence, and then we'll, uh, we'll try to bridge the gap from, from Brigham Young 1852 to uh, 1978, and then to our day. So Brigham Young, it's important to know, he, he only ever gave one reason for the priesthood ban, one reason only. Are you ready? So in his, in his speech on the January 23rd, uh, 1852, when he's advocating for slavery, he says this. When the Lord God cursed old Cain, he said, until the last drop of Abel's blood, 
receives the priesthood and enjoys the blessings of the same, Cain shall bear the curse. Then Cain is calculated to have his share of priesthood next, and not until then. Consequently, Brigham says, I am firm in the belief that they ought to dwell in servitude. They, uh, that is, the black Africans. Uh, that's interesting. So the only reason Brigham Young ever gives is the curse of Cain, sometimes a little mix of curse of Ham. We talked about that last time, but just a quick review. Four, four important reminders about the curse of Cain, that story when Cain kills Abel. God placed a mark on Cain. That mark was a mark of mercy, meant specifically to protect Cain from being killed. Nobody knows what the mark was. Nowhere in the, in the narrative of scripture is, the, is Cain's protective mark uh, ever mentioned as passing down uh, genetically to his children. There's no indication whatsoever in the text that black Africans are the descendants of Cain, but that's a tradition that grew up over the centuries, not unique to Latter-day Saints, actually centuries earlier, uh, that many Protestants in America believed, uh, used it to justify slavery. We see in this context, Brigham Young is invoking that. It's very popular. Invoke the curse of Cain, curse of Ham. And uh, that is a biblical justification for slavery, right? So, so Brigham Young's pulling right from his uh, environment in that way, but he's adding a little twist and saying, God cursed Cain as pertains to priesthood, which is another additional detail that's not in the text. It's not in the Bible, it's not in the Pearl of Great Price, it's nowhere. Uh, he goes on, he said, the black African cannot share in the priesthood. They cannot bear rule. They cannot bear rule in any place until the curse is removed from them. They are a servant of servants. He's quoting there the, uh, the story of Ham cursing uh, or having his son cursed by Noah. We talked about that last time. That's a, an odd story where Noah cursed his grandson Canaan to be servant of servants. But again, no connection in the text to a, general, a, a whole race of people becoming slaves. There's no, nothing in the text to indicate that uh, Canaan's descendants are black Africans, but that's the rationale that people uh, came up with. And that's alive and well here in 1852. Uh, just a reminder that the gospel topics essay uh, actually singles this one out, actually singles this one out and says, Today, the church disavows the theories advanced in the past that black skin is a sign of divine disfavor or curse. Uh, that's a strong word, disavow, right? We disown that. We repudiate that. Uh, so the one reason Brigham Young gave for the priesthood ban uh, has been repudiated by our modern church leadership. Now, what's interesting, which makes the story even uh, more intriguing, recently, even more recently, we, we found this talk. We know that uh, five days later, after Brigham Young gave that speech, uh, they met again. The legislature did a joint, joint session, and one of the legislators was Orson Pratt. He's also an apostle. You have Brigham Young, who's the governor and also president of the church. And this apostle, Orson Pratt, totally fiercely disagrees with Brigham's argument and reasoning on every point. Uh, he says to that body of legislators, he says, uh, I, I move that this legislature reject the bill in its entirety. And he decried slavery as an abominable evil. Uh, he specifically rejected Brigham's curse of Cain rationale, uh, arguing that divine curses come from God and that God's people could only enforce such curses, catch this language, if we are commanded by the Almighty to do so. Uh, he said, here's some direct quotes from that that we've got. Uh, he said, Shall we assume the right to inflict a curse on blacks without the voice of the Lord speaking to us and commanding us to? Uh, he predicted that if they presumed to do so, they would hinder missionary efforts abroad, uh, saying that those in every enlightened nation which have already abolished slavery will never hear the gospel of Jesus Christ if we make a law upon this subject. Right? It's, 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 it's barbarism, right? Of slavery and, and to, to try to enact curses upon people uh, when God hasn't commanded it. And then he asks incredulously, shall we take then the innocent African that has committed no sin and damn him to slavery and bondage without receiving any authority from heaven to do so? Woo, this is interesting. So you have an apostle challenging the president of the church or a legislator challenging the governor. Same, same, same thing. Same. Two roles, both of them. 
and saying, we have not received any revelation from heaven to do what you are proposing. Man. He, he said, the idea is preposterous in my mind. Uh, for us to bind the African because he's different from us in color is enough to cause the angels in heaven to blush. Let me and my garments be clear from this, Mr. President. That's how he ends his rejection. Woo! Things are heating up in the Utah Territorial Legislature. He gives another speech on the 4th of February, the same day that the bill passes, by the way. Utah does become a, a slave territory uh, for about a decade. Uh, but on the day that it passed, he gave another impassioned speech. Unfortunately, we don't have a transcript of what he said. <laughs> we don't know what he said. But what we do know is that the next day on February 5th, Brigham Young gave a rebuttal. Brigham Young gave a rebuttal to Orson Pratt's previous comments the day before. So it's kind of like playing Jeopardy historically. We know what Brigham said is like the, the, his answer, his response, but we don't know what Orson Pratt said. So we can try to kind of infer uh, from Brigham Young's answers what, what the accusations were. So what I'm about to say, we don't know for sure if Orson said any of this, but based on what Brigham Young says, which I'll share in just a moment, he seems to probably, probably, maybe have said something like this. Maybe he said, uh, Brigham, we have no proof that black Africans are truly the descendants of Cain. No other prophet or apostle has ever claimed this with certainty. We don't have any scriptural proof whatsoever that blacks should, shouldn't be ordained to the priesthood and given presiding positions uh, in the priesthood. We have nothing to fear by allowing blacks to have equal privilege with us both in the church and in the government at all. Maybe something like that. Uh, again, that's speculation, but we do know what Brigham said. So here's how, uh, how uh, Brigham Young responded. He said uh, a little passionately here, if, if there never was a prophet or apostle of Jesus Christ spoke it before, I tell you that this people that are commonly called Negroes are the children of old Cain. I know they are. I know they, that they cannot bear rule in the priesthood, for the curse on them was to remain upon them until the residue of the posterity of Michael, that's Adam, uh, and his wife received the blessings of the priesthood. So everyone else needs to receive the blessings of the priesthood first, then eventually the children of Cain. Okay, again, that's the only rationale Brigham Young ever gave. He gives it again here, second time, saying this is, this is it. Uh, and then he says something really interesting. And he says, I may vary in my views from others, and they, a little side glance to Orson Pratt, no doubt, and they may think I'm foolish in the things I have spoken and think that uh, they know more than I do, but I know more than they do, he said. Uh, I know more than they do. Uh, this is interesting that he calls what he just said, my, this is my views, this is my views, and uh, I, I know more than they do. I know, I know more than, than Orson Pratt uh, on this. Uh, and, and, oh, by the way, in this one, uh, isn't this interesting, uh, this, this first line, uh, if there never was a prophet or apostle of Jesus Christ spoken before, I tell you, et cetera. And that's interesting. Brigham Young is here acknowledging that he's striking out on his own. He's going out on his own here, right? This would have been a perfect time to say, well, Joseph Smith taught this, or, well, Paul taught this in the Bible, or whatever, right? Uh, this was his chance to really back himself up scripturally and and, uh, and to cite precedent or to cite a revelation if he had one, uh, but he doesn't. He says, all right, if nobody's ever said it, I'm going to say it right now, all uh, right? And then, he, and then he's now calling this, uh, he's calling this uh, my, my views, all right? This is my views. So, so kind of a sticky, challenging question that was uh, very difficult to answer for uh, a, a very long time was, uh, did God inspire the priesthood ban? Right? Uh, did he put this in place for some reason unknown to us? Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe one day we'll understand in the eternities why this was uh, put in place. Uh, and as we look at the, the, the historical record, what I've just shared with you, uh, the answer is increasingly clear, right? Uh, Brigham Young gives only one theological rationale for the priesthood ban. It's the, it's the Cain Ham. That rationale has been dis disavowed by the church, right? Uh, third, a fellow apostle is adamant that they couldn't presumptively impose a curse upon black Africans without the voice of the Lord speaking to us, without receiving any authority from heaven to do so. 
uh, and that Brigham Young admits that he's giving my views and that no other apostle or prophet had uh, taught such a thing. And so uh, all, all arrows here, right? There's every, every sort of hold in the past that said, well, maybe it was inspired. It, it had to be inspired, right? Uh, all those kind of are breaking away, right? Especially with modern church leaders disavowing Brigham Young's uh, one rationale upon which he built the entire uh, priesthood ban. And so that's, that's a little sticky uh, for us. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about kind of what to do with that, right? Uh, how, do you, how do you handle that kind of uh, prophetic error, right? Uh, that's, that's challenging. And so uh, I believe that's exactly what happens, by the way, in uh, Official Declaration 2 in 1978. This is the Lord's correction. This is the Lord's correction. A revelation of reversion and repair. That's official declaration too. Reverting us back to Joseph Smith's original policies of inclusion in priesthood and temple. Repairing uh, a, a diversion from that that occurred here. Um, so the question though becomes, well, how is it? So if Brigham Young introduced that, then what happened? What happened? There was nine presidents of the church between Brigham Young and Spencer W. Kimball. How, how was this not? corrected how is this not fixed right uh and uh and that's a super good question and uh it deserves a really long response i'm going to give you a, a medium-sized response uh but it's it's worth uh digging further into president kimball's uh own son edward kimball actually wrote up a fantastic piece in byu studies that uh, uh it's really long and detailed and very helpful in filling in the gaps here but let me give a uh a, a a one sentence answer, and then I'll tell you a little bit more. So what the historical record tells us is that uh, over decades of time, uh, Brigham Young's teachings became entrenched policy, supported by both false memory and false doctrine. That's what happens. False memory and false doctrine. Let me tell you some sad stories. All right, here you go. Uh, here's some timeline. So Brigham Young institutes the ban here. Then we get kind of this murky middle area. Uh, where, you know, there's not a lot of black people in the church. It's not really top of mind for a lot of people during at least the early part of this. Uh, the first uh, several decades, we don't really have very many members of the church that are, that are black African. And so it's not, not really on people's mind. Uh, what happens, we see in 1879, uh, Elijah Abel, we talked about him in our last, in part one, the first uh, black African to uh, be, a, be ordained to the priesthood. His, his wife died in 1877. And uh, he apparently had asked Brigham Young if he could be sealed to his wife. And Brigham Young said no. So after Brigham Young died, Elijah Abel now asked the new president of the church, uh, John Taylor in 1879, could I receive my endowment? And could I be sealed to my late wife? John Taylor says, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what the policy is here, which is really fascinating because if this was like, you know, super well known, uh, then that would be a strange response from President of the Church. But again, it's just not on people's mind, right? And so uh, this becomes another key moment as you have a, a black faithful priesthood man asking for temple ordinances. And President Taylor doesn't know what to do. So Sorry, he has. Could you say that again? Sorry. So, <laughs> uh, so then uh, he has a president or elder at the time, Joseph F. Smith, look into this. Uh, let me let me just so so here's Elijah Abel. He wants to know if he can be sealed. President Taylor sends uh, Joseph F. Smith to investigate the legitimacy of Elijah Abel's priesthood, and uh, he comes back after having reviewed. Uh, he interviewed Elijah Abel. He investigated his elder's license, patriarchal blessing. Uh, and he tells President Taylor that Elijah Abel is unquestionably a legitimate priest in man. John Taylor also knows that there's, there's two people still alive that, that claim to have personal knowledge about Joseph Smith's beliefs about blacks and priesthood. Uh, their, their names are Zebedee Coltrane and Abraham O. Smoot. Uh, Abraham O. Smoot lives down in Provo. He was the mayor down there. And Zebedee Coulter, uh, or sorry, Coltrane lived in Spanish Fork. Uh, so they're, they're invited to Abraham O. Smoot's house. President Taylor visits them there, and he says, tell me, 
you seem to claim that you know about what Joseph Smith said in terms of blacks and priesthood. What can you tell me about that? There's a man, Elijah Abel, who claims he's a 70, he's an elder, and uh, he wants to be married to his wife. And we're just trying to figure out what to do. Zebedee Coltrane, uh, he says, well, here's my memory of over 40 years ago. Here's my memory. I, uh, when Joseph Smith learned about Elijah's lineage, that he was black, uh, he, I remember he dropped him from the Quorum of the Seventy in Kirtland. He dropped him from the Quorum of the Seventy. Yeah, if I remember right. That's right. Yeah, that's what he did. Abraham O. Smoot says, now Abraham O. Smoot, he was from Kentucky. Uh, his ancestors held slaves when he came to Utah. He, he uh, uh, was a slave owner here during that short season. And uh, he says, well, I asked Joseph Smith about this one time uh, in Far West. And uh, Joseph said that uh, I shouldn't confer priesthood on blacks when I go on my mission down to the South, not confer priesthood upon blacks. So that's what John Taylor hears from them. He then, uh, J Joseph F. Smith says, that can't be right. Zebedee Coltrane's memory can't be right because I've seen the cert cert uh, Elijah's certificate of uh, being a 70 in good standing and it was in Nauvoo so he couldn't have possibly been dropped from the quorum in Kirtland and I've seen that he had it renewed in Salt Lake that can't be right <laughs> and so Joseph F. Smith is he's there he's he's kind of like no like he's legit so President Taylor says well <sighs> apparently he's legit but it, it, it was likely a mistake from Joseph Smith. Uh, and so uh, he was kind of the outlier. Uh, we'll let him retain his priesthood, but I, I do not authorize the uh, temple request. So 1879, no temple request. Joseph S. Smith saying, all right, whatever, right? 1895, uh, he reminds, he reminds church leaders that Elijah was ordained to priesthood at Kirtland under the direction of the prophet Joseph Smith. That's a direct quote from Joseph F. Smith. And then his memory starts to slide here. His memory starts to slide, starts to deteriorate. In 1904, in council meetings, when Elijah Abel comes up again, he remembers that that ordination was a mistake that was never corrected. And then in 1908, he, uh, he falsely claims that Elijah's ordination was declared null and void by Joseph Smith. Now that is in direct contradiction to his 1879 report. And uh, he also said some things in, in, in 1908 in that same meeting that, that showed that his memory was trying, it was starting to slip. He said some things that couldn't be true. They were out of order or some people had died that he, he rem remembered them being alive. And so, so 1908, that was not a good, moment for his memory for whatever reason but here's what happens by 1908 with that narrative that solidifies the idea that the priesthood ban began with joseph smith and that it had, it had always been this way from the beginning uh, it essentially erases black priesthood men from the collective memory of the church that's the effect that it has uh, people who learn about Elijah Abel's, they say that, that was a mistake or that was a that was an exception for who knows what reason. But this becomes the entrenched story uh, that's accepted. Uh, it isn't questioned by really anybody for decades. Uh, it just gets reinforced in each successive generation. And it's going to take a revelation to overturn this. So that's the that's the Joseph F. Smith a key moment there. Uh, tragic, really, in that way. Uh, then we get the civil rights movement and people start really questioning as, as society's views on, on blacks uh, begin to be elevated and understanding and, and very uh, boy, advocating for equality in every way with whites. Uh, the church comes under uh, con a added scrutiny uh, more and more, right? And, uh, you know, when, when really pushed, uh, the first presidency and, and uh, others, uh, Elder McConkey. Uh, Joseph Fielding Smith, um, people who were kind of expected to give doctrinal answers would say, well, uh, a few things. They would say, well, it seems like premortality has to be the answer, right? They didn't fully sign off on Brigham Young's uh, 
rationale that it was the curse of Cain, because Article of Faith 2 says that children can't be punished for their, their parents' sin. Does that make sense that Cain committed murder? Therefore, all of his descendants till the end of time would be uh, banned from priesthood? That doesn't. So, so leaders started to come up with an additional rationale saying, well, they had to have been culpable somehow. The, the, the blacks themselves must have done something in pre-mortality that earned them the right to be black, right? That, that, that kind of consigned them to that position in mortality. So, so that becomes one of the major answers uh, all throughout this time period is pre-mortal, less valiant or something like that. Uh, and then curse of Cain, uh, curse of, uh, you know, Pharaoh's curse and Abraham one started being talked about, the Canaanites, uh, so all that stuff. And then eventually, it, when really pushed, people would say, well, I just don't know. You know there's some uh, 1940s uh, first presidency statement that says, we don't know uh, where this, this ban originated, uh, but God has his purposes. It's God's ban. And only God can revoke God's curse, right? Uh, we understand it started in Joseph Smith's time, or, or it was already in place in Joseph Smith's time, right? So that collective memory is just there. And that's, you know, none of these people at this point were in the 1852 legislative meetings. And, uh, and there's no real reason that people have been asking the questions. But now the civil rights movement happens and we need to have more firm answers. Well, uh, President David O. McKay, he actually... Uh, starts making some progress here. There used to be a rule in Africa that you were guilty until proven innocent, meaning uh, you could not receive priesthood until you could prove that you were not, uh, did, had no black African ancestry, right? There's a lot of white folks in Africa, uh, but you couldn't be ordained to the priest until you proved you had no black African ancestry. President McKay reverses that and says, how about if you look white, then you can be ordained and, uh, you know, until proven guilty, until, you know, someone, you know, someone finds out or if you find out, then we'll just ask, we'll suspend your priesthood. But um, so he starts making some strides here. Uh, Hubie Brown, a member of the first presidency, uh, he proposes that the policy be reversed. He was not convinced by the, the rhetoric of the day among kind of the church cultural memory. He looks into it. He can't find a revelation that began the ban. Uh, he starts to question it big time and says, uh, I think this was just introduced by Brigham Young. I think it's just a policy. And if it was a policy coming in, it could be a policy going out. We could just create a policy if we vote. So he asks uh, for a vote to be taken. And it almost passes in the 60s. The Quorum of the Twelve were almost unanimously on board, uh, lost by one vote. and and, and uh, the president of the Quorum of the Twelve at the time, if I remember right, was Harold B. Lee. Uh, Harold B. Lee was kind of a hardliner in terms of the curse of Cain and premortal doctrines and believing this was a very divine curse. He said that he didn't believe that you could just vote, uh, vote God's will out. Uh, it, would, it would take a revelation. And he said he didn't believe that uh, this revelation or, or that, sorry, that policy would be revoked while he was alive. Uh, and he was right. Uh, it wasn't. <laughs> Uh, he became president of the church, short time, 18 months, and then he died uh, suddenly, and uh, President Kimball becomes president. Now, President Kimball, as you know, is going to get the revelation, but he's been thinking about this, too, for, for a long time. In fact, in, his, uh, in a letter to his son, uh, Edward Kimball, uh, notice the date here is 1963. The ban's not revoked until 15 years later, but in this letter, he's kind of, you can see him wrestling here. I, I wish the Lord had given us a little more clarity in the matter, but for me, it's enough. I know the Lord could change his policy and release the ban and forgive the possible error, he calls it question mark, which brought about the deprivation. If the time comes he, that he will do, I am sure, he said. So, so that's the, uh, uh, the journey President Kimball's already on. Uh, when he becomes president of the church, he's been thinking about this, looking into it, asking apostles to Will you, will you research this with me? Will you look into the band and see if we can find the origins? Can you find anywhere in scripture that would justify singling out black, black Africans and uh, barring them from the priesthood and temple? Can you, can you help me with that? Would you search that carefully and prayerfully? Will you pray about it? 
So he starts to build consensus among uh, the Quorum of the Twelve, and they're they're with him on it in his first in, in the first presidency. And so all those uh, the 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 justifications that were given. Uh, by the way, I should I should say that all those justifications that were given, like unrighteous actions in a premortal life, all of that uh, is, is, is disavowed. Black skin, inter interracial marriage was taught against in the church. Blacks were inferior. Uh, my goodness, uh, none, none of those explanations is, uh, is accepted today as the official doctrine of the church. As, as President Oaks put it, he said, some people put reasons to the priesthood ban, and they turned out to be spectacularly wrong. Uh, there's a lesson in that. Uh, nobody wants to be spectacularly wrong about anything, right? Um, and so some of the people, and, and uh, well, let's, let's just leave it at that. Uh, there, was, there were a lot of, 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 of folks that uh, said that that was, you know, it was this reason or that reason, uh, pre-mortal, whatever, wrong. Uh, they were all wrong. So, so what do we do with this? What do we... What do we do with all of that? Um, I think this is what we do, brothers and sisters. I think we just acknowledge it, number one. Um, does this require us to rethink some of our assumptions about true apostles and prophets? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. But so be it. So be it. Uh, I like uh, Elder McConkie right after this happened. Uh, here's what his advice was. He said, what should you do about all the stuff that was said previously? How about forget it? <laughs> he said, forget everything I've said or what Brigham, President Brigham Young or President George Q. Cannon or whomsoever has said in days past that is contrary to the present revelation 1978. Uh, he said, we spoke with a limited understanding and without the light and knowledge that has that now has come into the world. Ooh, that's so good. That's so good. We spoke with limited understanding. Is that okay? Can prophets and apostles speak with limited understanding and then change their assumptions when new light and revelation comes? Absolutely. That's exactly what occurred here. So this topic, as I, as I talked about in our, our first uh, caveat, this, this, this forcefully requires us to, to confront those comfortable assumptions about prophets and God, but it's a good thing. It's a very good thing. Uh, as, as President Uchtdorf said, he said, to be perfectly frank, there have been times when leaders in the church have simply made mistakes. Uh, God's perfect, but he works through us, his imperfect children and imperfect people make mistakes. Uh, Brigham Young himself uh, said this. He wasn't talking about the priesthood ban, but just in general, this is uh, what, uh, six years after the priesthood ban was implemented, he said, can a prophet or an apostle be mistaken? Don't ask me any such question for I will acknowledge that all the time. But I do not acknowledge, this is, this is important, I do not acknowledge that I designedly lead this people astray one hair's breadth from the truth. I do not knowingly do a wrong, though I may commit many wrongs, right? Uh, that, that's important. Uh, clearly, President Young was acting out of his own honest convictions here. You know, sometimes people will say, well, I thought President Woodruff said that the Prophet can't lead the church astray, right? Uh, what does that mean? Well, Brigham Young is explaining here, I think, exactly what that means. Uh, God won't let a prophet knowingly, like deliberately, lead the church into apostasy and destruction. God won't allow that. But does God allow for apostles to make mistakes, uh, to imbibe some things from the culture around them, to feel really strong about that in Brigham Young's case, and to announce that as a policy to help bolster slavery in Utah and to keep keep the peace here with the Southern converts. Yeah, yeah, he lets him do that. Remember how he let Joseph Smith uh, lose the 116 pages of manuscript? Uh, that was a consequential mistake. I don't know if we fully absorbed that. That was, that was a consequential mistake. Uh, we're still uh, being affected by Joseph Smith's mistake at allowing the 116 pages to, to be lost. We're not benefiting from them. A lot of prophetic effort went into writing that. Uh, Mormon did the abridgment. Lehi wrote the, the account. A lot, of, a lot of effort was wasted, and we're not benefited by that. And that's on Joseph Smith. But in DNC 3, the Lord says in verse 10 to Joseph Smith, remember, God is merciful. Therefore, repent. Repent of the thing which thou hast done in going contrary to my commandments. 
So boy, God, God allows prophets to make mistakes. Sometimes they're consequential, like this one. <laughs> um, uh, but, uh, but that's okay. Uh, he allows it, and he also corrects it. He corrects it in time. Uh, you know the story? You know the story? Uh, I won't uh, go too long in this. I assume this is the more well-understood uh, part of the story. The long promised day occurs. Uh, President Kimball, he said that, uh, uh, this is five years before it happened. He said, revelations will probably never come unless they're desired. That's an interesting insight. I believe most revelations will come when a man is on his tiptoes, reaching as high as he can for something which he knows he needs, and then there bursts upon him an answer to his problems. Uh, President Kimball was on his tiptoes when it comes to this. He was reaching. He had the first presidency in 12 reaching with him. This is what is what brings about the long promised day. Uh, as they determined that they would lift the ban, President Kimball invited the Quorum of 12 and First Presidency to join him uh, to propose that to the Lord and seek his confirmation. So they'd already made the decision to lift the ban, and now it's time to seek confirmation. Those that were there, I mean, the witnesses that were there, there's so many cool stories. Uh, they talk about a unity of feeling. Elder Perry who was there. Uh, he said, I felt something like the rushing of mighty wind, like at the Kirtland Temple. When President Kimball got up, he was visibly relieved and overjoyed with the spiritual outpouring. President Hinckley, who was there, said that, uh, that there was a hallowed and sanctified atmosphere in the room. It seemed like a conduit opened up between the heavenly throne and the kneeling, pleading prophet of God. Uh, and there was an assurance. The power of the Holy Ghost gave us an assurance that the thing for which he prayed was right. Yeah, he said, every man in that circle by the power of the Holy Ghost knew the same thing. President Benson said, our bosoms burned with the righteousness of the decision we had made, right? God is confirming to these apostles, what you are asking is righteous. Yes, yes, extend the blessings of the priesthood in the temple to all my children. Yes, yes. Mother McConkie said, uh, there was a great Pentecostal outpouring of the Spirit, such as none of those present had ever before experienced. That's saying something, considering who's in the room, right? He said nothing could have been more clearly and forcibly presented. He said the voice of the Lord had been heard. All knew what should be done. And he said never in their experience in the church had they ever felt or experienced anything uh, in any way comparable. David B. Hayton, who was there, said the outpouring of the Spirit in that room was so strong. Uh, that none of us could speak afterwards. Uh, President Monson, who was there, he said the revelation was clear. It was clear. Uh, the Lord confirmed it. Elder McConkie, a few months later, uh, gave a talk where uh, he was explaining this to a bunch of uh, Seminary Institute teachers. And he gave this interesting insight. He said, when we seek the Lord, speaking about the Quorum of the Twelve and First Presidency, when we seek the Lord on a matter with sufficient faith and devotion, he gives us an answer. You'll recall that the Book of Mormon teaches that if the apostles in Jerusalem had asked the Lord, he would have told them about the Nephites. But they didn't ask, and they didn't manifest the faith, so they didn't get an answer. That's so interesting. And then Elder McConkie applies that to what just happened uh, with him. He said, one underlying reason for what happened to us is that the brethren asked in faith. They petitioned and desired and wanted an answer, President Kimball in particular. But all of us wanted it, right? This is the first time in over 100 years where the Quorum of the Twelve unitedly wanted to know an answer to this burning question. And the Lord gave it to them with a rushing mighty wind, with a burning feeling of the righteous righteousness of the decision they were making. And so, uh, revelation requires hard work and bur a burning desire, uh, and, and it, it requires, it requires uh, unity among the apostles. And if, if they aren't ready for a revelation because it counters their worldview too deeply, uh, God can wait. God is patient. God can work these things out in time, uh, which is exactly what he did in this case. So, uh, boy, that's a lot uh, that we've that I've just talked about. Uh, a lot of kind of heavy stuff. A lot of uh, 
hard hit in history, uh, but it's, uh, I think, in context and understanding God's goodness and patience with prophets and with his people, uh, I think it, it ends well. It ends beautifully. Phase, uh, phase three here, uh, this, this uh, reversion, right? This is a revelation of reversion and repair to the founding truth and practice that we started with, with Joseph Smith. And so uh, uh, that's what happens with, with official declaration too. Powerful. Let me just give you one final thought and I'll open up for Q&A here. My final thought is this. Uh, sometimes as I talk about this, uh, I look into, into Brigham Young's eyes and I wonder what he would be thinking if he knew what I was saying. Uh, what, what, what are you teaching your students, Brother Woodward? Uh, what are you saying? <laughs> um, uh, my whole life, boy, I, I love prophets of God with my whole soul. I, that's why I study them so, so closely. I just want to know everything about them, about their history. Um, I believe they're a wonderful mix of uh, weak, simple, error-prone sinners whom God works through to do amazing things. Ordinary people through whom or extraordinary things happen. Uh, and so my, my instinct when I hear anything about uh, prophets that could be viewed in a negative light is to sort of uh, defend them, you know, let's defend the, the brethren, right? And I think that's a good and a righteous instinct. Uh, but as I look at Brigham Young's eyes on this issue, uh, I, I hear him saying this to me. Uh, I hear him saying, Brother Woodward, don't worry about me. Don't worry about me. Uh, Jesus and I have already worked this out. Uh, he has forgiven me. Uh, and if you, if you harbor any resentment, uh, I would invite you to forgive me too. Uh, I no longer hold 1852 ver uh, views on, on race, just so you know. Just so you know. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm in a better place now. <laughs> um, I hear him saying, if you, if you want to defend anybody, why don't you defend our brothers and sisters of color who are still hurting because of this? Uh, why don't you do what the living prophet is asking you to do now in uh, leading out, in abandoning attitudes of prejudice, right? Rooting out racism. Uh, do that. Uh, if you want to defend somebody, defend them. I'm okay. I'm going to be all right. Uh, God is merciful. He forgives people who make mistakes. And so uh, that's, that's where I would leave uh, my thought with you, brothers and sisters, uh, to just rise up and do what the prophets of God are asking us to do today in leading out and abandoning attitudes of prejudice and, and rooting out racism wherever we see it, gently, with compassion, but with determination. Um, it's time. <laughs> it's past time. Uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Okay. All got right. Some, got some questions? Hey, yeah. Let me remove the spotlight so we can see everybody again. Um, well, thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, I am going to, I put in the chat box for anybody that can see that, um, the link. If you want to ask some questions, I'll let uh, Brother Woodward um, start looking at some of the questions here that people have already asked. I'm also gonna create a QR code uh, for Brother Price's class. Um, if, and then I'll share my screen. And then if Brother Price, anybody from your class wants to ask questions, they can just scan that QR code and it'll bring up the, the box for it. All right, I've got, a, uh, I've got some questions here. Can I start firing away here? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, question just came in two minutes ago from uh, Anonymous. Uh, what would you say to a person who rejected the church during the time when the priesthood ban was in place because they didn't believe in the priesthood ban? That's a great question. Uh, there were such people. Yeah, this, this, this uh, irked some folks, right, as people looked into it and found that there's no real, there's no revelation underneath this. There's no evidence of that. And they started being pretty skeptical about the current leadership. And, uh, I would just remind them of Doctrine and Covenants 21, you know. When the church, on the very first day the church was organized, the Lord told church members what the relationship ought to be between them and the prophet. And uh, maybe, maybe I can even just, just quote from that. 
uh, if you'll indulge me here. Um, he said this, he said, uh, wherefore, meaning the church, thou shalt give heed unto all his, Joseph Smith's words and commandments, uh, which he shall give unto you as he receiveth them from me, uh, walking in all holiness before me. For his word ye shall receive as if from mine own mouth in all patience and faith. Uh, why on the very first day of the church did the Lord say, yeah, you're going to be getting my word through him uh, and you should give heed to all of that. But listen, it's going to take patience and faith, right? Because it's not always easy for you and me to understand when the prophets are speaking for God and when they're not speaking for God. And so if the consensus among the prophets is currently a position that we don't hold, uh, I would say we continue to sustain them. We sustain them in, in patience and faith. We wrestle with God. Uh, on our own, but I, it's it's never been productive in the history of the church to strike out against the prophets of God and and start to to raise your voice and and, and try to call them out. Uh, that just that just never ends well. Uh, God can correct error, uh, and He did here in this instance, as we saw. It took some time for the people to be ready, for the prophets to be ready, for consensus, for unity building. Right, that President Kimball did so well, building unity among the Quorum of Twelve and uh, inviting them to all ask unitedly. And so patience and faith, I would say, uh, to somebody who was so irked, they just wanted to, you know, they love the Book of Mormon, they love Joseph Smith, they love church history, they love the doctrine, they love the person that they become when they live the truth. But man, there's a policy that I hate. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm out of here because of that. Like I'd say, uh, I'd say to them, uh, patience and faith. Yeah, if there really is error in it, right? then uh, the Lord will correct that in time. If there's not error in it, and if you're wrong, um, then uh, patience and faith will have served you well as well. So either way, I think patience and faith uh, would be my answer there. So, good. Uh, let's see what else here. What else? Good questions. Um, what do we know about female African-American saints during the priesthood band? Yeah, there's a... Uh, so, but probably the most famous is uh, a woman named Jane Manning James. She was uh, she lived in Joseph Smith's house uh, in Nauvoo. Joseph loved her. He wanted to. He wanted. Uh, he and Emma came to her and asked her if she wanted to be sealed to them as a daughter. Do you want to be sealed to us as our daughter? And that's how much the Smiths loved her. She at the time didn't know what that meant. She's like, I don't know what that means to be sealed as a daughter. So I don't know. And then Joseph Smith dies shortly after that, and then. She comes across the plains. She comes to Utah. She writes a letter to Brigham Young years later and says, hey, uh, Joseph Smith and Emma invited me to be sealed to them as a daughter. But I didn't understand it at the time. But now I do. Can I do that in the temple? And her uh, request was denied. Then John Taylor became president. And she says, hey, President Taylor, Joseph Smith said I could be sealed to him as a daughter. I didn't understand it at the time. But now I do. Can I do that? And uh, he said, no, uh, that was denied. Uh, it keeps getting denied uh, until after she dies, after the priesthood ban is, is removed, then that happens. But it's a, it's a, it's, it's a sad story. There, there, again, uh, there's not a lot of, of Black Africans in that for this first few def decades. We're talking about maybe uh, there's a cool project that uh, Brother Paul Reed, maybe the, the best historian on this topic uh, out there, uh, he's a faithful member of the church, and he uh, actually was the chief uh, writer of the, the Race and Priesthood essay. He started a project called uh, A Century of Black Mormons, I think it's called, and you can just Google that phrase, and you can see how many members of the church there were who were black in the first 100 years of the church, and uh, it's not much. Uh, we're talking like a few dozen at first, first few decades, 50 uh, you know, into the 1900s, a uh, hundred or more. I mean, it's, uh, it's not very many. Uh, then as we get closer to modern day, people in Africa want to join. There's a bunch of people in Brazil who have black African ancestry, uh, women and men who are faithful and want all the privileges. And, you know, that weighed on President Kimball's mind as well as other apostles, seeing those faithful people denied and not really having a good answer for them as to why. So all of that played into it. So, so yeah, women and men. Uh, the most famous is, is, is Jane Manning James. And it's a 
it's a touching and, and kind of sad story, that middle piece of that story, a little bit sad. Um, okay, let's see. Just kind of skim in here. Are there online resources where we can learn more about this history from faithful and reliable sources? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, best place to start is the church's uh, uh, essay, gospel topic essay, Race and the Priesthood. And, uh, and also consider the footnotes to be part of the essay, all right? There's some amazing footnotes. Follow those footnotes to, to longer articles. I mentioned uh, President Kimball's own son, Edward Kimball. He wrote a great piece in BYU Studies that goes over all of his history uh, and really zooms in, especially on his father's experience receiving the revelation. He does a great job building the context. It's a very faithful source uh, and uh, is not trying to protect anybody by withholding information. It's not, not, just very faithful and good and, and, and shows, uh, kind of shows it all, if you will. So I'd recommend uh, those two sources for sure. So check out those footnotes and follow those. Okay, Brother John, how are we doing? We need, how much time we got? I'm, I'm okay. I don't know. Maybe we can get some feedback from some other people. I'm, I'm enjoying this a lot. So I'm, I, however you want, long you want to go. If, if you feel, if anybody feels like they, they have learned enough and they, or they have a time constraint, feel yeah. free to, uh, to go out. You will not be judged. We promise. No problem. Well, here's a good question. Uh, how do you find the balance between being fiercely loyal to the brethren, uh, yet knowing that they are infallible? Mm. So good. So good. Uh, I, I tried to give a little bit of an answer to that last time. A similar question was asked, but what I think this is, this is the sticking point, isn't it? Uh, this is the sticking point. We, we love the brethren. They are their heroes. They are to me. Uh, I sustain them with my whole heart, and uh, I don't like it when their errors are shown. <laughs> I don't, I don't enjoy it. Uh, but at the same time, I don't enjoy uh, participating in or, or you know, in any way perpetuating false history. Right? I don't think that serves anyone. And so, when the history shows what it shows, uh, I think we do what uh, the Lord said. So, patience and faith. Um, but also, I think it's okay to examine our assumptions about prophets. Uh, have, I, have I inflated my assumptions? Do I have kind of like a cartoon version of prophets in my mind where they, they're not supposed to make mistakes? You know, Where did that come from? Uh, that's certainly not in the scriptures. All you're going to find in the scriptures are prophets who make mistakes from the very beginning. I think this, at the beginning of the story, it starts out with Adam uh, who disobeyed God. I don't know if, if you remember that part. Uh, then you go to the next story, right? Uh, you're going to see it with Abraham. You're going to see it with Isaac and Jacob. You're going to see it with Moses. You're going to see mistakes. You're going to see Jonah. Oh my goodness. Jonah's like, those people deserve to die. I don't even want to call them to repentance because I'd rather watch them burn. Talk about racism, right? Uh, the people of Nineveh. Uh, and yet, you know what the Lord did with that? I gave him a, a well of an experience to try to turn him around. He goes, teaches, invites him to repent. They actually do repent. And he's like, ah, dang it. Right. I don't get to watch him burn. I get say, Jonah, man, you got problems, brother. Uh, you're just going to, you're just going to see, you're just going to see if you read scripture carefully, prophets who uh, have failings, they just do. Uh, so I don't know, first of all, where the assumption comes from uh, that, uh, you know, we should expect anything different. But I will say, I understand it. Like, I'm disappointed when it happens. And uh, so how can I be fiercely loyal to the prophets while still acknowledging their infallibility? You know, I, I honor their keys. I honor their keys. Uh, does, did Brigham Young have the keys of the kingdom the entire time all that was going down? Absolutely. Right? Uh, does that mean everything Brigham Young says is, is from heaven and gold and he's not influenced at all by... The, the broader culture. Uh, no, why would that? That doesn't equate, right? So keep our eyes on the keys, be prayerful, patience and faith. Uh, read scripture carefully to recognize that for every hero story about a prophet, there's also prophets who are making errors, questioning God, right? Section 93 of the Doctrine and Covenants, another good example. The Lord spends 
over a dozen verses rebuking the first presidency, uh, specifically for not uh, paying attention to their families and neglecting their children and uh, not teaching them correctly. And how many times does the Lord tell Joseph Smith, I forgive you in the Doctrine and Covenants? That'd be a fun search. Uh, he's, he's Joseph Smith made mistakes, but God's quick to forgive. Joseph believed it. Brigham Young believed it. True prophets believe that. And so, I don't know, for me, this in some ways it kind of is freeing and it helps me feel like God's maybe going to be patient with me as I try to give him my full heart, but I can't do that very well. I don't know, maybe, maybe some of you got this down, but uh, I, I just don't do it very well. I try and sometimes I have good days and good weeks. But sometimes I just crash and burn. Uh, I make mistakes. I'm fallible, but God is merciful. I keep coming back to that. God's merciful to us, to prophets. Uh, so that's that's how I kind of navigate that. Fiercely loyal to their keys. Do they have the right to direct the kingdom of God on earth? Yeah. Now the Lord said, the kingdom is yours until I come. He said that in the Doctrine and Covenants. The kingdom is yours until I come. Then it's mine. Um, when the king comes, then the kingdom will be turned over to me. In the meantime, you've got the keys. You can make decisions that may have negative consequences. But in time, I'll, of course, correct that. Nothing ever goes permanently wrong when Jesus Christ is involved. Uh, I, I, I hang my hat on that. Nothing goes permanently wrong when Jesus Christ is involved. So if there are mistakes being made, uh, Christ will allow those to, to eventually be, uh, be corrected. That's, that's been the story of scripture, and that's the story of this particular issue. So here we are on the other side of God having corrected that. Yeah. Woo. You guys are good. Uh, thanks so much for your time. Uh, hopefully that was all right. Uh, Brother John, any final thoughts? Or, uh, <laughs> you good? Everybody yeah, good? Yeah, no, let me, let me, there's, can I get one more question? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I, just, ask. I don't know when to stop is, is my problem. <laughs> I, uh, I just had somebody uh, send me a, a direct message um, question, and I just wanted to, to honor that question if I could. Um, it says, so th this is the, the full text. It was too long to put in the, the Slido um, website. They only give you 160 characters. They're, they're cutting us off here. Wow. Um, okay. But the question is, so your presentation frame for your presentation frames the ban as a mistake fueled by racism. Um, it seems the official stance from the church now is just we don't know why, which may make it seem like God deliberately did it for his own reasons. Um, I think saying clearly that it was racism and a mistake would go a long way towards us being able to speak more freely about this and healing the hurt it caused to our brothers and sisters of color. Um, do you think that will change? Yeah, great question. Awesome question. Yeah, so there, there is this kind of uh, persistent feeling by some in the church that we don't know. We just don't know what happened. <laughs> I've tried to show you today. Uh, yes, we do. We actually know what happened, right? What we don't, here's what we don't know. We don't know. I'll tell you. I'll tell you what we don't know. What we don't know is why did Brigham Young switch from 1847 saying, we don't care about the color, to 1852 saying, we care about the color. Why, why did he say one of our best elders is a black African in Massachusetts, Walker Lewis, in 1847? In 1852, he says, blacks cannot hold priesthood, not one jot or tittle, because they are of the children of Cain. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know. Nobody knows the answer to that. So if you want to, if you want to pinpoint what we don't know, uh, that's what uh, we can't get at historically. We have some guesses, right? It seems he's bothered by interracial marriage happening in the church. He seems to try to want to accommodate members of the church coming from the South who are bringing their slaves with them. How are we going to handle this dynamic here? And Well, if we introduce slavery, how do we justify that? And Well, there's a common justification in our culture broadly, and that's the curse of Cain. And so it kind of, you know, that's my theory of what happened. But nobody knows. Nobody knows why he did that. If you want to assume, well, it was probably a revelation. And if we don't know, it was a revelation. Well, then what you have to do is you have to deal with the fact that uh, his only reason he gave was the curse of Cain, but that's been disavowed by modern church leaders, 100%, that his fellow apostle was telling him, we haven't gotten a revelation to do what you're asking us to do, Brigham, and, uh, and that Brigham Young admitted that this is my views, and I'm striking out in a, in a direction that is unprecedented by past prophets and apostles. 
So I think with that, with the, with the, you have to deal with all that. If you want to, if you still want to say, I don't, we don't know what happened. We just don't know what happened. Uh, we don't know where this came. It must have been inspired. Uh, I think there was a day when you could say that. There was a day when you could say that. But that is not this day. Uh, we, we can no longer say it like that. So when people want an apology or whatever, you know, that the church would go a long ways in, uh, in sort of just recognizing this, I, I think the closest we got is the, is the, the race and priesthood disavow. We disavow what Brigham Young said. We disavow what all the other people said about premortal life and about interracial marriage. We just disavow it. We disown it. We repudiate it, you know. Uh, President Nelson's last conference talk, was it, when he's talking about, or is this in 2020? And he's saying uh, in no uncertain terms, like uh, God's children, all his children have access to all the blessings. This is, he favors no other, no one group above another because of skin color or anything like that. Like if that's not a repudiation of everything that has gone before, right? Uh, with Elder McConkie saying, hey, forget everything we said because we were operating on less light than we now have. Like that's an admission. If that's not an admission, I don't know what's an admission. I, we, we didn't know what we were talking about. Uh, we were talking, you know, in what our understanding of the time, but now more revelation has come. So, you know, I, I just think, uh, you know, nobody's alive right now that instituted the ban, you know, so we can't, can't really uh, get any apologies that way. But, boy, we've gotten everything but Brigham Young himself saying, I'm sorry, don't we? We've got repudiation after repudiation. We've got uh, disavowals. So. I don't know. Yeah, maybe, maybe you know, maybe there, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the church leaders will one day uh, say uh, Brigham Young was wrong and we apologize, right? Uh, but uh, I don't know. I, I, I doubt it's going to come like that. It's come in the ways that it's come as gentle and compassionate toward Brigham Young and all the previous church leaders, kind of a forward facing looking, right? Let's, let's just let's look to the forward uh, or to the forward, to the future. Let's look forward to the future. And let's try to heal the wounds that are that are still here. And let's be forces for good and leading out in abandoning attitudes of prejudice. Uh, oh, can I show you guys one more thing? Can I share my screen? Just to just to just to highlight how cool our our current prophet is. Uh, talk about leading out. Uh, he's doing it. Watch this. Let's see. If, uh, there we go. Okay. Share. And so this this uh, Reverend here. You got to Google this. Uh, Google Reverend Brown. President Nelson, NAACP. There's a, about a nine-minute talk where Reverend Brown, I think he's a Baptist preacher, uh, accepted a, a gift from President Nelson of like millions of dollars uh, to support NAACP's initiatives to educate Black people in uh, underprivileged uh, areas. Uh, and uh, Reverend Brown, man, he just like dotes on President Nelson. He's, he calls him uh, he calls him my brother from another mother. Uh, he, he said of President Nelson, my favorite line, he says, President Nelson, you are the quintessential embodiment of the best leadership in the faith community of the United States of America, anywhere to be found south of heaven, north of hell. <laughs> so good. He said this. Oh, this is great. Great compliment. He said, uh, you're the reincarnation of one Joseph Smith. Uh, who <laughs> he's got so much spunk when he says it. Uh, who back in April the 6th, 1830, had a vision for a spiritual community. And that vision was not egocentric, self-centered, or nationalistic. That vision was about love for all humankind. Uh, so talk about leading out in abandoning attitudes of prejudice uh, and rooting out racism. The President Nelson just shown us how it is done. And he's, he's creating bridges in lots of cool places right now just to follow his example. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, the people are kind of waving the social justice pitchforks and just demanding an apology. It's like, you know, honestly, let's, I think, I think the apology has been given lots of different times and lots of different ways. Uh, and let's, let's, let's join the way, let's join the movement and momentum of just moving in more productive ways in, uh, in helping to abandon attitudes of prejudice and root out racism. So there you go. There's my, my, uh, my thought on that. Thank you all so much. Hopefully there was something valuable in there for you. Uh, it's been great to be with you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Brother Woodward. We, we appreciate it. If you guys have any other questions um, or if you would like the slides that um, Brother Woodward has, has presented here, I'm going to put my email address 
in the chat box. And feel free to send me an email and I will make sure to get those sent to you. Um, again, thank you, Brother Woodward. We, we appreciate it.